And I'm really grateful that uh, Brother Isaac filled in for Candy today, and um, this filled in for Shane. <laughs> um, I miss them when they are not here, but uh, hopefully they'll be back with us next week. They just wanted to stay home to make sure everybody else would be safe as well, and I, I appreciate that. But um, the Lord always has somebody on standby to help us, and I'm certainly grateful uh, for Isaac's help this morning. We started um, a message on Wednesday about, you know, just really who is Jesus. And, you know, this is the Christmas time of year where they celebrate his birth, and we read the Christmas story, and we really, a lot of times, don't quite get the prophecy that was involved in all of the different verses all the way from the Old Testament to the New. And so today is kind of like a, a more of a Bible lesson than a sermon, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. But uh, the, the Christmas story really started in the Garden of Eden, believe it or not. Yeah. Now, the man and the woman were the only two human beings on earth. They were perfect. They didn't have to work. They had everything handed to them. They lived in an absolute paradise, and they still messed up. That ought to make you feel a little bit better about yourself this morning, <laughs> realizing that under the most perfect of circumstances, man is going to mess up. And here, they were allowed to do anything they wanted <coughs> except partake of the fruit of one tree, and that was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And when they had done it, they, they, they took the fruit, Adam and Eve took it and ate it, and the Lord said unto the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, well, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Now, they had been passing the buck. Uh, God asked Adam, well, why'd you do this? He said, well, that woman you gave me, she's the one that she, she gave it to me, and I ate. And then he looked at the woman and said, what did you do? And she said, well, the serpent put me up to it. And nobody else could answer for anything else but the serpent. He was stuck. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, you are cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field, and upon your belly shall you go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And here's the prophecy. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed, and he's speaking really to Satan, and to her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. A most unusual verse. Probably one of the most unusual verses in the Bible when God said to Eve, your seed. That is biologically impossible. Biologically impossible. But it happened with the virgin birth. And that was a prophecy of the Messiah coming to deal with with the Antichrist in the future. Then we have another one that was a type of Christ, a prophecy of Jesus' birth and what he would do when he got here. And it took place in Genesis chapter 22. Now the Bible is full of prophecies. Matter of fact, the book of Psalms has hundreds of prophecies in it. And most of the Old Testament books do, but this one it is a particular one we want to particularly pay attention to right here. God gives another prophecy in Genesis chapter 22 of how he plans to redeem man. And he did it by asking the very founder of the nation of Israel to give up his son. Now here Abraham was a hundred years old and his wife was 90 before she conceived her first child, which was Isaac. They waited that long. Abraham had been walking around with his name meaning the father of many nations. And he was 100 years old and didn't have any kids. How do you think he felt about that? What's your name? Well, my name is Abraham and it means father of many nations. How many kids you got? None. 
but his wife got pregnant at the ripe old age of 90. My wife ain't even 60 years old, and if she told me that right now, I'd probably have a heart attack. <laughs> at the least I would do is lay in the floor and cry like a baby, because I don't have the energy to take care of children no more. I'm done with my five. They're all in their 30s now, praise God. And just the thought of me being 64 years old raising a tiny baby, I just don't know. I mean, God would allow me to have the strength, but I'm just not looking forward to doing that. But anyway, here Abraham had waited all this time for this child. And God said, I want you to take him up on Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. How do you think Abraham felt that long ride to Mount Moriah? And so we see here in verse number 6 of Genesis 22, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it upon Isaac his son and then he took the fire in his hand and a knife and they both went together. They walked together toward Mount Moriah. And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, there's the fire, and there's the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham made a prophecy. He said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And they both went together. And they came to the place that God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there. And he laid the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay him. And the angel of the Lord called out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Don't lay your hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him, for I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. That was a prophecy of what God himself would do. It said, Remember where the Bible said God gave his only son for us. And that was a foretelling of what Christ came to this earth for. Then we see the one that I was been waiting to tell you for a good while out of Exodus chapter 12. Here the children of Israel had been held captive for nearly 400 years by the Egyptians. They were made slaves. And they cried out to God and he decided that it was time to deliver them from bondage. Maybe you feel that way this morning. Maybe you're watching by TV or Facebook or whatever means you're watching or you're sitting in here and you feel like you're in bondage. Well, there's a way out of it. No matter what your bondage may be, there is a way out of it. Here God speaks to Moses. And he shows where that the sin of the people must be washed away and covered by innocent blood. Not a one of us in here are innocent. I can just about prove that. <laughs> and speaking for me, I'm not either. None of us are innocent. Somebody innocent had to die for us to get us saved. Somebody perfect, somebody spotless, somebody sinless. That ain't me. And that ain't you. But the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, and he's getting ready to deliver them, and he said this, This month shall be a beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. It's about April is when this took place. Speak to the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Now they had to take a spotless 
perfect lamb and put it up for four days to observe it to make sure that there are no flaws. It had to be the very best that you had in your flock. And it said, your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And you will keep it up until the 14th day of the month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. That normally means in the afternoon. Anybody know what time of day Jesus died? What time in the day? Three o'clock. Does anybody know what was going on in Jerusalem at that very moment at three o'clock? Passover, and they were all killing the Passover lambs at that moment to get ready to use the blood as an offering at the moment that Jesus gave up the ghost and put his soul in the hands of God the Father. At that very moment they were doing that. Jump the gun a little bit there. The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill this lamb in the evening. And they shall take the blood and they would put it in a bowl. And they would take a, a, a hyssop. It's a limb with some leaves on it pretty much is what it looks like. And they would dip it in the bowl. And it said, you will strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses where they shall eat it. If that's a door post, they would take the blood, they would strike it on the top, they would strike it on the left and on the right. What does that form to you? A cross. That was done thousands of years before a cross was ever invented. And the blood was shed this way on the doorpost. And it said, They shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Not, they shall not eat of it raw, nor sodden with water, but roasted with fire, and its head with his legs, with the pertinence of a million. You had to eat all of it. And that's the way it is with Jesus. It's either all or nothing. You can't pick the parts of Jesus that you want and discard the rest and go, well, I'll do this and I'll do that, but I'll take this much of Jesus. It doesn't work that way. Jesus put it this way pretty much, either you're all in or you're all out. And leave nothing of it to remain until the morning, and that which remaineth in the morning you shall burn with fire. When Jesus died on the cross, he was not allowed to stay on the cross all night. He had to be removed because it was Passover and taken down from the cross and buried to fulfill Exodus chapter 12. Remember John the Baptist kept referring to him, Behold the Lamb of God. And that is what Jesus came to be for us. And thus you shall eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You'll eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. That's really one of my favorite verses. It's right now. Don't worry. I've, I've had so many people tell me, Dave, I've I'm, I'm, I got to get myself straight and I'll be in church. Well, you know what? You'll never be in church if you wait to get yourself straight. You can't get yourself straight. Only Jesus can do that. He always says, come as you are. That's the beauty of what, uh, of what I love about Solid Rock. Nobody has to get themselves straight to go to church here. Nobody has to prepare. To, you come just like you are, no matter what. If you just got off from work, if you got your uh, whatever clothes you got, to come on down here. Because he says, do it now. Do it in, in haste. And, and be ready at all times. There's no preparation. Just do it. You don't have to go get this fixed and that straight before you accept Christ. You let him clean you up. And then he makes this warning. When they struck it on the doorposts of their homes. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. And I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. 
and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. When you are covered by the blood of Jesus, that's all he sees when he looks at you. He doesn't see you as you really are. And I'm glad he doesn't look at me as I really am. He sees the blood of Jesus when he looks. I didn't earn it. You didn't earn it. It's a free gift. Let him cover you with his blood and wash you clean from your sins. And when he looks at you, he won't see you as you really are. He will see the blood of his son. And he said, in this day shall be unto you for a memorial. You'll keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. And you will keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Jesus died at the time of Passover. And there's so much more to cover on the story of Passover that I'd be hours, and I'm, I'm gonna probably do a series of it at least on Wednesday nights about this. But now let's look at the details of Jesus' birth in a little bit of a different light. In Luke chapter two, it'll make Luke chapter two come a little bit more alive for you. And it came to pass in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. That is an old English word for census. They weren't doing it to get money. They wanted to count in the, in the Roman Empire of where everybody was and how many people they had. They were taking a census. They used the word taxing for that. And if it's anything like today, you can bet later on they'd stick a tax on you, okay, after they find out where you are. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed or to register for the census, everyone into his own city. Now listen to how this worked out. God arranged it where everybody would have to return to their ancestral city in order to be registered for the census. Therefore, Joseph had to leave Nazareth. That was a rough, rough town that he lived in. People would even say, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You ever had your neighborhood insulted before? Anything good come out of Hogtown? Anything good come out of uh, this town? I'm not going to mention some of them because there's a lot of people watching. I'm going to get a lot of hate mail. So, but there are some towns that I could mention that are just prime for this. Well, Joseph had to return to his ancestral city to register for the census. So Joseph had to leave Nazareth and make the trip all the way up to Bethlehem. Now it was prophesied in the Old Testament that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. When Herod heard about Jesus, he called the scribes in and they were experts on the Bible. And he said, look it up, tell me where he's going to be at. And they said, well, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And remember, that all the time with God, don't ever fear, don't ever panic. Remember the answer is on the way, even before you ask it sometimes. The answer from God is on the way. He had this whole thing set up, and Joseph didn't know. Joseph went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea into the city of David which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary his espoused wife being great with child. That's an old English term meaning she's very pregnant. Matter of fact she was nine months pregnant when they traveled. Mary was espoused to Joseph. Now, under the Hebrew reckoning, that's way different, and I shared this Wednesday night, I believe. They were only engaged and had never slept together, but an engagement in those days had to be broken by an actual divorce, and if you went and was with someone else while engaged, you would be arrested and tried for adultery, which was a capital crime in those days. 
I've often thought it still ought to be sometimes. I'm going to leave that alone. Any other man than Joseph would have had Mary stoned to death for adultery. But God picked the right man to marry her and to watch over her while she was carrying God's son in her womb. He was a just man and was going to divorce her quietly. And the angel of the Lord told him, don't be afraid to marry her and take her as your wife because that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And he did. He listened. And, and anyway, God's timing was perfect. She was very pregnant. And when the order from the Roman government came out just in time to have that baby in Bethlehem, God had it timed perfectly. People, again, I want you to understand that God is always on time. Even when we don't think he is, even when everything looks gloom and doom, don't worry, God is on time and he will not let you down. His plans are always perfect. And so it was while they were there, the days were accomplished that she would have the baby. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Now you know every child can say that verse. We wrapped him in swaddling clothes. What in the world is swaddling clothes? You know, I've had five kids and ten grandkids, and I've never seen no swaddling clothes yet. Well, I looked it up and found that what they do, or what they did, and believe it or not, it's a new trend to do it with babies now. This generation, what is it, second generation below us, are now starting to use swaddling clothes with their baby because it actually gives them peace of mind, keeps them calm, and helps them develop, and it even shuts out the chance of catching that sudden infant death syndrome. Here's what they do. Here's what swaddling clothes was. It was long strips of linen that they wrapped the baby in to where he's just like this, almost like a mummy. And it keeps the child completely still, and they literally are happy like that. I would not be happy like that, but it works great for the child. I've seen Candy and Shane do that, and Amarissa is just as happy as she can be when she's wound up good and tight. But they used long strips of linen, and they wrap, now they don't do that today. They use, you know, a, a cloth or whatever, a blanket to wrap them in. And they wrap the baby Jesus over and over in those long strips almost like bandages. That was swaddling clothes. That's what Jesus was wrapped in when he died. The very same material. And they wrapped him around and around. There's more, so much more to tell you about the frankincense and the myrrh and all that other stuff. And let, let me say this, God doesn't do anything without a purpose. There is a prophetic purpose in every word that come out of his mouth, everything they ever did. Now, swaddling clothes, as I said, was used to bury Jesus as it was when he was born. And the very clothes that the baby was wrapped in was prophecy in itself. All right, now, it says they laid him in a manger. A manger is nothing gl uh, uh, glamorous. It is a feeding trough used to feed sheep in those stables. Jesus made the statement that I am the bread of life. And to this day, he still feeds his sheep. Think about it. There was so much purpose in everything. That manger wasn't there for, by any accident or anything. It was all prophetic. And then the final verse and we'll be done, is it said, because there was no room for them in the end. God arranged that. That was no mistake. That was nothing that caught God off guard. He knew all about it. And he planned it. And God arranged it for several reasons. But the biggest reason has rarely been understood and rarely ever been preached from the pulpit. There was something significant about the stables in the town of Bethlehem, 
particularly the town of Bethlehem, the stables where they were always, where they raised the sheep in. They were used, the stables, listen to this carefully, the stables in Bethlehem were used exclusively to raise perfect, flawless, sacrificial lambs that were to be used every year. Oh my goodness, think about that. God had his son born in one of those stables because he was really the only perfect, flawless, sacrificial lamb. Yeah, give the Lord a hand. God never did anything by mistake. There were no just a matter of circumstances. He calculated every single thing. All of Jesus' life was calculated. His death, his burial, his resurrection, everything was calculated, and it was calculated for you and me. You and me. That's how much he loved us, was to do all of this with his son so we could be saved. How much more simple can the gospel be than the virgin birth and the perfect life and the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what you need to do is completely put your trust in him today and he will change your life, he will save you. But you've got to let go of your fear, you've got to let go of your mistrust and you've got to stick your neck out and say, I'm going to trust you Lord, I'm going to trust you. And I've never met a person who put their trust in the Lord that was ever let down. I've let the Lord down, I know, many, many times, but he's never let me down. And he will not let you down either. And so this morning, in the small crowd that we've got, we're going to, uh, Isaac, can you do a song of invitation for us, brother? We're going to have a song, and, and uh, we're going to have a couple of people stand down here if you need prayer for any reason and give you an opportunity to take it to the Lord today. And don't forget to pray for all of those that are out sick and unable to be with us this morning. Let's stand. And if we can have a couple of...